I once heard a sermon titled, How Low Will You Go? And my question for you today is, how low will you go for a friend? In other words, how low will you go to show the love of Christ? Would you clean someone's house? Would you wash someone's car? Would you wash someone's clothes? Uh, would you be like the Good Samaritan if somebody's injured or they're sick or maybe they had surgery and you would clean their wounds and give them a bath so they would feel that much better? How low would you go? Would you give them your last $5, your last $10, your last $100 so they can have something to eat? How much sacrificial love will you show someone for the sake of Christ? This is what our lesson is about. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Reverend Dr. John W. Wilson III, bringing you the Sunday School lesson for this week, November the 1st. We are going to have a great lesson today. Our lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, then 34 and 35. The title of our lesson is called Serving Love. But before we get into the lesson, I want to remind you to hit the share button, the like button if you're on YouTube please hit the subscribe button. I would like for this lesson to reach as many people as possible. And guess what? I need your help. I can't do it without you. So I thank you in advance. So let's get into our lesson. Our lesson starts in John 13. It's the last week of Jesus. Actually, it's on a Thursday. The setting is on a Thursday. Uh, the time is near for him to die on the cross. In fact, the very next day, he will die on the cross on Friday. And so he has some parting words, some parting teachings that he would like to give his disciples so that they may not grasp all of it now, but they may grasp it, they will grasp it at a later time, especially uh, after his death and resurrection. And then again, after the Pentecost, when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's get into our lesson. Uh, Thursday, it's a Thursday evening, supper time. They are in the upper room. It's the 12 disciples. Jo Judas is there. All the other disciples are there. Uh, the, the thing is that before you eat, it's customary that your feet would be washed. And in this upper room, uh, there is a basin, uh, there is, which is a bowl. There is a towel and there's a pitcher of water, and there's a long table, a low table, which the disciples and Jesus, they lean into the table, they lean on their elbow, and they eat off the table. They eat off the table, and their feet are extended behind them. That's the setting that we have there. Now, what's absent from the setting is that, on which is customary for the uh, foot washing, because they walked everywhere they went. And so when you got to your destination, uh, hospitality, it was a custom, a Jewish custom, that you would have your feet washed. That was a great uh, display of hospitality. Now, it wasn't done by the, uh, a Jewish person. It wasn't done by the owner of the house. Or it doesn't, was it done by the person that was hosting? Was it done by the wife generally? Was it done by a Jewish person? It was really done by a slave, in particular, a Gentile slave, someone who's on the lowest of the lowest of the totem pole because foot washing was uh, seen as, as being beneath um, the Jewish people. It was seen that it was a menial task a task that was shameful, a, sh a task that displayed where you were in society. And so uh, the foot washing wasn't done by anybody. So they're in this upper room, but there's no one to do this foot washing. There's no slave girl. There's no Gentile slave to wash the feet of Jesus and the disciples. And so this is our setting there. They're preparing to have the, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the, the meal. 
and they're just getting started. So let's see what the Bible says. It says, now before the feast of the Passover, that's the that that weekend when they uh, came and the Jewish people came to all of Jerusalem from all above and they celebrated the Passover uh, from Egypt during Moses' time where the, uh, the death angel passed over the houses of those who had blood marked on their doorposts. So there's, that, that has not occurred. That is coming up in a matter of days. And uh, the Feast of the Passover, this is before, so it's on Thursday. It says, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father. Jesus had all along said, don't say this, don't do this, don't tell about this miracle. My time has not come. The time is not yet. Well, now we know that his hour has come. The hour has come for, the, for him to die on the cross. The hour has come for him to fulfill his duty. The, uh, the, the hour has come for him to uh, bring salvation to all those who would believe. So his hour had come to depart out of this world, going back to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, meaning that he loved all those disciples, he loved the entire world, having loved his own, his own and those who followed him, those who would believe in him, who were in the world, he loved them to the end, meaning that he is dying for people that will eventually love him or that who love him and that they will have the salvation. And it says he loved them to the end, meaning that he never stopped loving them. He loved them when he, when he, when he was there on earth and he's loving them in his death as death approaches now. Never stopped loving those who were his own. Never did. Never did. Did not quit on them. Um, he's loving them all the way to the cross. Did not quit. Going to fulfill his purpose. And that's key there. It says, during the supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So during this supper, as I said before, Judas is here. Judas uh, has succumbed to the temptation of Satan to betray him. Uh, Judas had left the door open for Satan to come into his heart because of his greed, because of his, of his power hungriness, because of his poor character. And he's allowed Satan to come into his heart. And when Satan came into his heart, Satan just took over from there. Now, when Judas betrays Jesus, I don't want it to be said that the devil made him do it. No, Judas could have stopped at any given time. He, the, Satan cannot make you do anything you don't want to do. Judas could have said, no, no, get behind me, Satan. He could have said, no, I reject you, Satan. No, I'm not going to do that. But because of his poor character, because of his desire for wealth and power and, and to see the Jewish people reign and uh, he was a zillion of some sort, he uh, went along, he succumbed to the temptation of Satan and that meant betraying Jesus. So here we have uh, Saint, uh, Judas is at the table. He is uh, consumed by Satan to the point of betrayal. It says, Jesus knowing, the next verse, verse 3 says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. Look, what, this is what Jesus knew. He knew that the father, he knew he had authority. Jesus always knew who he was. He knew that he was the son of God. Uh, Jesus was divine. He knew he had all power, all authority. Uh, Philippians uh, chapter 2 talks about he laid aside his attributes. He knew all the attributes that he had, the omniscience, the all-knowing, the all-powerful, being uh, everywhere at every given time. He knew all that. Jesus was a powerful person. He had the status in heaven. He had, he had position with God. He was God. Okay? And so Jesus, knowing all of this, that he came from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper. Rose from the supper. What is what what's happening here in the picture that John is painting because John was an eyewitness is that this 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 God, this God man, Jesus, 100 percent man, 100 percent God. Status in the kingdom. 
God himself, all powerful, all authority, knew his purpose, rises up and does something incredible. Something you would not think someone of that statue, someone being God, would do. And so he did, this is what Jesus does. He rose up, he laid aside his outer garments, meaning that he took off his clothing, took off what he was wearing, his outer, not all of his clothing, but his outer garments. Taking a towel, tied it around his waist, Ties around his waist because he's going to use that towel to dry something off. And what, is, what, what uh, John is painting a picture of is that Jesus in all this power and status that he has, you and I would say somebody else do it. You and I would say I'm too powerful for this. You and I would be puffed up. You and I would not go low enough. We would not go this low. He takes the form of a menial slave to wash the feet of the disciples. Not only does he wash the feet, he dresses like a menial thing. He takes out his outer garments, wraps a towel around his waist like any slave would do, and proceeds on to washing the disciples' feet. He says, laid out his outer garments, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. John was there. He was an eyewitness. He had specific details on what Jesus did. Took the form of a slave. In other words, he humbled himself. In other words, he went low. He went low in order to show love to the disciples. He went low to demonstrate what humility was to the disciples. He went low, as we'll find later, to serve as an example of what the disciples need to do if they were going to be part of his kingdom, if they were going to be called one of his disciples. Humility. He knew that they could not fulfill what he had planned for them, what their purpose was, without humility, without this example. And now he says, if I can do it, that's what he's going to say later on, if I can do it, this right here, the lowest of the low, Jewish custom, washing dirty feet, washing dusty feet, reserved for a menial faith, if I can do that, then you can do this also. Not only this, you can do this self-sacrificing, humiliating things also for the sake of, of Christ for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of reaching other people here. Now, this also of the foot washing is symbolic of Jesus cleansing the dirt off the feet, but it's also symbolic of what he's going to do on the cross. He's going to wash away the sins of the world. He's going to cleanse the disciples of their sins. All those who believe will be cleansed of their sins. So it has a a demonstration in the physical realm, but it's also a spiritual realm there of the washing away of the sins of the world. That's what he's about to do. So here we have here, poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, wiped them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Now, he's going to disciple by disciple by disciple. He comes to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And he says in a way like, it would be like us saying today, um, Lord, you're washing my feet? Why are you washing my feet? You are above that. I, I, somebody else needs to be that. That's reserved for somebody else down here, and you're up here. And Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand, but afterwards you will understand. Jesus is embedding a message into their memory bank. So when they are out there doing ministry, when he is gone, they'll remember this incident here, this what is foot washing here. So when they have to go beyond what is, what is customarily low or degrading, they will be willing to do that because Christ had, did it for, they had done it for them. 
You don't want to, they don't understand what Christ is doing, how he's illustrating that I am washing away the sins of the world, how he's illustrating servanthood, how he's illustrating sacrificial love, or is he illustrating servanthood, or he's illustrating just because you are a disciple of mine and you are blessed with the gifts or blessed to be in that position, you are not so high enough where you can't go low and serve your neighbor. So my question is that, is there anything you won't do for your neighbor? Is there anything that you won't do to show the love of Christ? Is there anything that you won't sacrifice for the betterment of the kingdom to display the love of Christ? Will you love your neighbor? Will you help your neighbor in need? Will you clean their house? Will you bathe their feet? Will you uh, do something that inconveniences you? Will you do something of great humility uh, in order for you to do it for them? Uh, will you give them the clothes off your back and you wear the raggedy clothes and let them wear the better clothes? When someone hits you on the cheek, will you in humility turn the other cheek? When someone steals from you your cloak, will you in turn give them another cloak? When someone attacks you, will you in humility be able to walk away? When someone verbally abuses you, will you be able to restrain yourself in all humility and still love them and still show loving acts? What Jesus is saying is that as a disciple of mine, you're going to need humility. You're going to need humility because you're going to need to show acts of love. The love that I'm showing you, you're going to need to show that type of love too. And you're going to have to have humility. Meaning that you have all the power to do something about it, but you restrain your power because for the sake of loving them. Jesus did not have to do that. He could have ordered one of them to wash the disciples' feet and his, but he did not. He did not, but he humbled himself and did it himself to show humility and self-sacrificing, sacrificial love. So Jesus answered, what am I about to do? You don't understand, but afterwards you understand. And a lot of times in life, uh, God brings us through things or shows us things that we don't fully understand until much later. And this is the case with Peter. He's going to end the disciple. They're going to understand fully much later when he's gone why this foot washing took place. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. How, Lord, you are not going to, I am not going to let you wash my feet. He means well, but his pride comes in there. He means well. But he can't conceive of the concept of Jesus who he admires, who he loves, who he looks up to, uh, coming, subgrading himself to the point of coming down to a low position and washing his dirty feet. He can't conceive that. The other disciples are probably, except for maybe Judas, are thinking the same thing, but they're not saying anything. Peter tended to be the spokesperson. Whatever was on his mind, he tended to say, and this was on his mind. But they're thinking the very same thing. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said, if I do not wash you, wash you, you shall have no share with me. Jesus said, if you don't let me do this, no share means inheritance. There will be no inheritance for you. I mean that you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, you will not inherit the blessings that come with being part of the kingdom of God. I mean, there will be no salvation. You will, be not, you will not be part of my flock. You will be rejected. Then Simon Peter goes to the other end. First he said, you will not wash my feet. He hears that, how he's going to be rejected from the kingdom, from eternal life, uh, from the blessings that come with the kingdom. And he says, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. He goes from one extreme to another. And Jesus has to reel him back in. Jesus says to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for its feet, but is completely clean and you are clean. Look what he says here. Simon says, Lord, wash me all over. Wash me good all over. I want to be part of your kingdom. 
But Jesus says, the one who is bathed does not need to be washed. By me washing your feet, that is enough. That is bathing you completely. I don't need to wash your head and your feet. By you allowing me to do that, you are bathed completely. And you are completely clean. And he says, so he says here is that by me washing your feet, you are completely clean. I don't need to wash your hands and your head. You are clean. In other words, what he's saying is that by, by allowing me to do this, you become part of the kingdom. And therefore, you don't need to be washed again. Uh, once your sins have been forgiven by Christ, they need not be forgiven anymore. Once the atonement has been made, there need not be another atonement. That's what he's saying. So he's telling Simon that by me washing your feet, you are clean. You're, 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 you're clean. I don't need to do your hands and feet. I, I, your hands and your head. You are clean. He says, but not every one of you. But not every one of you is clean. Although I'm washing all the feet, even Judas, not all of you are clean. Judas, Judas is not clean. Because he doesn't believe. Because he has rejected me. Because he's betraying me. It says, for he, it says right, for he knew who would betray him. And that's what he said. Not all of you are clean. Jesus knew what was going on. But what made Simon Peter clean in the spiritual sense was not the physical foot washing. It's what he, who he believed in, who he trusted in. And that was Jesus Christ. And, by, and, and, and having his sins forgiven. Verse 12 says, When he had washed his feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, so he's finished doing all those things, put back his clothes on. He says, do you understand what I've done to you? He talks to the disciples. You call me teacher and Lord. You are right, for so I am. Why did Jesus do what he just did for them? Verse 14, that part of our passage, but it tells us. If then your Lord and your teacher has washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you a perfect example of what it means to serve one another. If me, your teacher and your Lord can wash your feet, then you ought to be able to wash the feet of others. He goes from greater to, to lesser. Me who is up here, if I can do this down here, then you who are here can also do what is down here also. In other words, they have no excuse in serving their fellow neighbor. If then, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet. You ought to wash one another's feet. Does that mean literally wash another's feet? It could mean that, but it also means that you ought to go to great lengths of sacrificing. Sacrificing your pride and your ego and your arrogance and whatever will be holding you back. Sacrifice all of that to help someone else in need. A lot of times it's weird because uh, we may have homeless, we may have people with mental illness, and uh, people, uh, they may go there to help them, but they don't want to be associated with them. And I think that's wrong. And what it here, what it means, foot washing means that you have to do things that you don't want to do. You have to show love by sacrificing your pride and your ego in, in exchange for the will of God. Some people say we need to evangelize, but when it comes time to evangelize, they will not evangelize because they don't want to be rejected. They don't want to uh, be told no. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be humiliated. But what Jesus is saying here is that to be my disciple, you are going to have to take the chance of being humiliated and rejected and told no and have your feelings hurt. And be shamed. Just for the love of that individual. Because that individual needs Christ. And because you are my disciple. And this is what my disciples do. That's what he's saying. So it's beyond foot washing. We can't let anything hold us back. From showing the love of God. And serving our neighbor. 
Nothing can hold us back. It may mean going into neighbors, neighborhoods we don't want to go into, going to a house that we don't want to go into. It may mean a lot of things, but it should be nothing that holds us back from sharing the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing. So here, let's go to 34 and 35. And uh, si at this juncture here, Judas has left, he's gone to betray Christ, to meet with the uh, Roman authorities and to those Jewish leaders, to get his 30 pieces of silver. And so he's out to Rome, and this is what Jesus gives him one last command. And it says here, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That love one is that agape love. It's not that feeling, touchy feeling or all those. Others. It's the love that I, I will myself to love. It's that unconditional love. Okay? It's that love, I don't care who you are. You can't do anything for me. I'm going to love you no matter what, love. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Look at the example in which I have shown love to you. Look at the example have I humbled myself to you. Look at the example of what I'm about to do. I love you so much, I'm about to go to the cross to die for you. Look at the example that I have shown to you and turn around and love your neighbor in that same way. I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also ought to love one another. In other words, that sermon I told you about, how low can you go? Jesus went to the point of the cross, and the cross was full of shame. It was reserved for criminals, and he died for us, not even caring what people thought. And a lot of times, we don't love one another because we care what people think too much. Oh, I'm not going to do that. That's going to make me look bad. Oh, I don't do things like that. Oh, let somebody else do that. No. How low can you go? How much can you humble yourself? To help someone else in need. To show the love of Christ. Look what he says. I'm going to reiterate it. He says uh, that you love one another just as I love you. Ask yourself how has Christ loved you? He's forgiven me. He's had mercy on me. He's given me grace. Things should have happened to me that, that did not happen to me. He's blessed me with things that I don't I have no right to be blessed with. He died on the cross for my sins. He showed me what it is to humble, uh, to humble himself. He came down from glory where everything was fine, paradise, couldn't be any better. Came down to a wretched, sinful world, took on the human form, walked around in human form for 33 years, uh, being disrespected, spit upon, hit upon, and ultimately being placed on the, cro on the cross. Sacrificed everything for me. And so what he's saying here is that remember with the love that I have shown you, all the teaching, the peace and joy that he's given us. Remember all of those things. Healed us when we were sick. Uh, provide a financial blessing when we were uh, poor. Given us our daily bread. He does all those things. Uh, give us comfort in a time of distress and depression and, and sorrow gives us hope to make it through this world brings people into our lives to lift our spirits up and show us the way allows us to live and breathe each and every day to praise his name look how much love that Christ shows us he could have just shut us down stayed where he was but his love for us compelled him to come and die for a cross. How sacrificing that was. And so the love that he's trying to tell us to do, our love has to be sacrificial. It can't be a love of convenience. It can't be a love of, of, of feelings. Uh, I, don't, I feel like it today and I don't feel like it today. It's a love that requires commitment. Because here it says... He loved his own to the very end. He was committed to 
his people, his own, those who God had given him to the very end. He loved them to the end. And we had to be committed to the very end, too. He says, um, uh, it says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. By this, all people will know that you are all my, all my disciples if you have love for one another. If you want people to know that you are a child of God, you want to make Christ pleased with you, then love one another in the way that he has loved you. That brings much pleasure to him. And then the world will know that you are a child of his. And guess what? His name will be lifted up and people will be drawn to him. That's the power of love. People say, how can you love somebody like that? It's been Christians throughout centuries uh, when plagues have come out, when uh, diseases have come out. It's been Christian people who have stayed there at the risk and cost of their own lives to minister to those who were in that were suffering. And the world looks upon that and says, how could they do something like that? How could they put themselves in harm's way? And the only answer is that they know Christ and they're loving people in the same manner that Christ loved them. My challenge to you today is to go out and love somebody. Be led by the Spirit. Love somebody in the way that Christ has loved you. If Christ has been good to you in any kind of way, be good to somebody else. Especially somebody else that can't do anything in return. Christ did all that. We can do nothing for Christ. He needs nothing. The only thing that he asks, if you are my disciple, what I've done for you, do for somebody else. That's all he asks. I hope this lesson has been a blessing to you. Uh, this Think of foot washing. Sounds so small, so thing, but so powerful implications, especially in the context of that Jewish culture. That's the last thing you would expect somebody to do for you. The last thing. And Christ did it for the disciples. He would do it for you and for me. What a testimony. What an encouragement. What an act of display of love. And then he goes on from there and goes on to the ultimate act of humiliation, dying on the cross, all because he loves us and wants us to be part of his kingdom. I hope you have a great Sunday. I hope you have a great Sunday school class. I hope something was said that blesses you, that you can uh, uh, build upon in your class that helps you understand the scripture better. God bless you. I love you. I love you much. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.